Welcome to the Rheology Podcast. My name is Scott Johnson. I am not a trained theologian, nor do I have degrees in theology or the Bible. I'm actually just a regular guy who loves and follows God, but wanted to know if there was more to what I was experiencing in the world of church. This podcast is the collection of a journey to dig much deeper into the realm of faith. Reology itself, the word itself, is is the study of the do-over, and it's founded on the philosophy and the principle of stopping what I'm doing and thinking why I'm doing it, especially when it comes to what I know about God. Jesus, and ultimately what this has to do with me. If you listened to the first episode and you've chosen to follow the rabbit hole to see just exactly how deep it does go, hey, I'm glad to have you along. There's no doubt about it. But if this is your first encounter, I would strongly encourage you to go and listen to the first episode because I think it'll give you a a better foundation of the conversation that I'm trying to start here. This is episode five, The Guilt Gospel. So once again, let me let me start this episode off with a true story from the Legends of Ministry Past, aka stuff that I experienced in full-time ministry. It was late November 2010, almost nine years ago from when I'm doing this podcast. I was uh, new on staff at a fairly new church. We had just finished up a Sunday uh, series that took us through the month of November. And we were now getting ready to ramp up for December, which for most churches could either be feast or famine attendance wise. And apparently the year earlier for the church I was involved in now, which I was not involved in a year earlier, it had been famine, apparently not good. So on this last Sunday of November, at the very end of the service, our lead pastor stood on the stage, and he pleaded with the attenders to make it a priority to come every Sunday for the month of December. Now, when I say the word pleaded, that is exactly what it was. It was a pleading moment when he said this, Please, please, please don't miss one Sunday through the month of December. I beg you. Please don't miss. We need you here. I can distinctly remember my reaction when I heard him say this. I, I immediately thought to myself, is this what it has come to? Is this leadership? The, the rest of the staff, we actually felt the same way. We kind of talked about if we had known he was going to do this, we would absolutely try to talk him out of it. Probably not a great idea. It sounded like he was begging because that's exactly what he was doing. Actually, even some of the other people in the service mentioned it to me later. We had become so desperate that we were now guilting people to come and to attend. In my 13 plus years of full-time church ministry, I witnessed several instances of trying to get people to come to something. I mean, come on, that's kind of the nature of church. In youth ministry, when I was working specifically with teenagers, uh, it would be frustrating, no doubt, to, you know, create an event, to market it, you know, get the word out, to physically put it together and then have a poor turnout. Truthfully, it was very tempting for me to get frustrated at the kids themselves. It would be real easy for me to blame them, you know, to say things like they weren't dedicated enough or they didn't have their priority straight or they weren't, you know, quote unquote, real Christians. But for me, I kept coming back to this position of realization, that that realization being of understanding my audience. Who's my audience here? And at that point, they were teenagers. They were kids. They were young and they couldn't help being young. That's just the way it was. Now, I could have blamed it on their parents you know, not making a youth event a priority in their family for their kids. You know, if their parents were better Christians, they would make their kids attend just on principle. But again, my realization was that they weren't to be blamed either. Now, if I hadn't done anything to partner with these parents, 
you know, to make this a more of an us thing instead of a me thing, well, then the blame couldn't be theirs. And what I came to understand more fully was that I needed to really get to know my audience and to build a better foundation and relationships, which takes time. And maybe, just just maybe, my events were not as great as I thought they were. Maybe they were, in a teenager's mind, lame. I mean, no one's going to come if they don't want to come. And I had to start questioning my own motives. When an Arby's, just as an example, when an Arby's gets built in our community, they go through the same routine, basically. As a franchise, they want to follow certain marketing steps, of course. They get the land, they build the building, they hire and they train the employees, and then they market their product. They get the word out. Then they open the doors and they kind of just wait. Now, if they market the roast beef and no one shows up, do they blame their potential customers? Well, I really hope not. I mean, that would be kind of crazy. It would do no good whatsoever. The potential customers would just, they'd go get some food somewhere else. They could care less. They don't know how good the roast beef is. Arby is just like a lot of other businesses, obviously. They try to get customers to come into the building and purchase their product. Duh. If the experience for the customer was good, the customer will come back. If the experience was great, they'll come back and they'll tell a friend or two. But if the experience was not good or bad, they probably will not be back. Arby's, just like any other business, know how important first impressions are. Every business is shooting for a great experience, but not all hit the mark. To use a website marketing term here, this is called UX, user experience, which is the most important part of business. How do people feel when they're using a product? How do they feel when they're browsing a website or walking through a store or talking with a representative on the phone? It's very important for a business to find out what people thought of their experience. That's why they want us to take surveys. They want to know. I mean, just look at the most important factor of online shopping. Let's take that. Ratings, right? Ratings. How other people felt about their experience will have a direct effect on whether I'll try the product or even buy it. So blaming the customer because they didn't have a good experience is pretty much just flat out crazy. No business that wants to stay in business does this. None. Unfortunately, a lot of churches and a lot of Christians have started embracing a really, really horrible method of getting people to church. Now, in my world and in a lot of people's world, that's called marketing. They're using the marketing method of guilt. They're trying to make people feel guilty for not showing up at church. Now, if you listen to episode four, you'll remember I was talking about a rising trend of people moving away from church, but not from God. The, those people are called the duns. I mentioned how I would see what I call frustration posts from pastor friends of mine or other pastors who would ultimately blame people for their lack of attendance on social platforms like Facebook, laying on the guilt. Basically, trying to make people feel bad because they weren't dedicated. Problem is, it doesn't even work because people don't even really get that guilty. They don't feel guilty, or at least long enough to make a real difference. I just recently saw a, a post that says, you know, real men go to church. And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> so apparently if I don't go to a church service on a Sunday morning, 
I'm not a real man. Another post I recently saw was shared about uh, from a woman um, urging other women to bring their kids to church. Now, I won't share the whole thing here because, quite honestly, it's just way too painful to, to read through. I'm not even going to link it in, in the description, that's for sure. But trust me, it was, it was bad. Majority of the post, first in the beginning for sure, talks about getting going through the trouble of getting sleepy kids out of bed, racing them through the house to get dressed, running out of the house with a shoe in one hand and a makeup bag in the other, throwing the kids in the car, throwing pop tarts at them to eat in the car, running through the rain, enduring all of this craziness and chaos to get them to church for one main reason alone, they say. Because Jesus is there. Which, of course, is so theologically sound. And it's, and it's right in line with Scripture, of course. The rest of the post talks about and focuses on what kids will experience there and then how it has eternal value. And then in the end, it says this, and I will quote this part. It says, Let them see you set aside schedules and extracurricular activities and work and busyness to be present with the Lord in his house. I promise you won't regret it. I promise you it won't return back void. Take them to church. I promise it's worth it. I'm just not sure anybody can promise such a thing. How can you promise that they won't regret it? Maybe someone, maybe someone's done all this. They've gone through all the chaos and craziness to get their kids and themselves to church. And their experience wasn't good at all. Maybe they've been doing this for a long time and they finally just gave up. And another thing this post doesn't mention at all any of the other 167 hours in a week where a parent can teach their kids about God, be an example, be in his presence, just by living life. Nope. It just focuses on one day, Sunday, and it focuses on one hour between 10.30 and 11.30 or whatever. And it just focuses in on it being in one specific location. An article I read recently off of an atheist website, actually, was about a Minnesota pastor who created a marketing video about getting people to church. And, and here's his really, really awesome idea. He said, and this is all right before, the week before the division championship in the NFL, between the Minnesota Vikings and the Philadelphia Eagles. And he says this, If people really wanted the Minnesota Vikings to go to the Super Bowl, praying for that outcome in church was their best bet. Because if they lose, and I quote, you're going to have that guilt on your conscience. He urged people to first show up to church on that Sunday and pray there for the Vikings. The atheist from the site concludes, Forget Jesus. Forget salvation. Forget the fact that the Vikings were actually blown out by the Eagles, 38-7. to Forget how people are starving in other countries. But you want God to listen to your sports ball prayers. I can't tell if this is just bad theology or a horrible marketing campaign. Well, I would say that's a little bit of both. With the documented decline of church attendance in the past several years in the United States, I think pastors are starting to get desperate. I think they've, they've grown up, and we've grown up in a world of principle. That you just went to church on principle. That's just something you did. And that's really not the world we live in today. Some are resorting to making false claims that aren't biblical at all. 
delivering guilt-laced decrees about attendance and then modeling that for the faithful attenders that are still hanging around. Maybe we should start questioning what I was forced to question back in my youth ministry days. What's our motive here? As you probably already know, if you've listened to the first episode, the English word church, our English word church, it isn't in the Bible where we think it is. It doesn't mean what we think it means. The Greek word ekklesia that Jesus talks about building and dying for in Matthew is basically his body of people, the body of the Christ, those who are daily obedient followers of his teachings, those who are given different gifts to go and make disciples of all nations, mainly those who are called to a higher calling of loving people unconditionally. And we call those people Christians. That's what we call them. Jesus used the word ecclesia. The English word church actually just points to an organization, a nonprofit organization, a ministry. Now, there are a lot of nonprofit organizations that are set up very much like churches. There are lots of ministries that are set up very much like churches as well. And that's because they're all basically in the same type of entity. My wife, she works for a nonprofit organization. They consider themselves a ministry. They have a goal of loving people and helping kids have a better future. They have a staff, they have a building, they have a budget, and they have programs. They've got programs that they have created to help meet the goals and the objectives of their ministry. Just like the church. The church, it's it's not the ecclesia. It's made up of the ecclesia. It's made up of Christians. But it's not what Jesus came to build and die for, because it's man-made. Now, I completely understand the frustration of people not showing up to something that you've created. I understand the time and effort that goes into creating that event. That's something that's, that's, that's meant to help people in a certain way. I understand doing that as a career of it being the main thing that you do and it's and, and it being your absolute passion. I, I get that. I get that. And I understand taking all of that into consideration and then having high expectations, but result, resorting in just a few people showing up or not everybody showing up. It's frustrating. I get it. It is. It's, it's really frustrating. But when it comes down to it, If you're a pastor and you're putting together an event that few are coming to, or not everybody's coming to, when do you stop blaming those who aren't showing up? When? I'm thinking it might be time to have an honest conversation with yourself about what and why you're doing what you're doing. Be bold enough even to have an honest conversation with those who don't come as to why. Now, I'm not saying they'll answer you, but give them the go ahead to be blunt. I don't know, maybe a blind survey. But when you do that, you have to have an open mind and you have to be ready for criticism because maybe the event you're putting on is not as great as you think it is. Even though the intentions may be fantastic, If it's not resonating, it's not resonating. And here's the thing. The thought that these people who aren't showing up, the thought that they're not good Christians just because they don't come every week and because they don't come and they sit and stare at the stage with anticipation while the pastor preaches for 40 minutes... They're not good Christians. That is just absolutely wrong. Flat out. It's not anywhere in the Bible. Jesus never mentions it. None of the disciples, apostles ever mention it. They talk about not giving up meeting together, but that doesn't necessarily mean showing up on Sunday morning. It's nowhere to be found. Now, the pastor of the church that I talked about earlier, right? 
he had a really hard time preaching under 45 minutes. I kid you not. He continually went over 45 minutes and sometimes ending around 55 minutes or even an hour. And when we as a staff would bring this up in our weekly meeting, he would become obviously a little defensive. And he said this. He said that what he had to talk about, these people needed to hear. I guess he was like under some impression that we were living in the mid-1800s without the internet or TV or radio. As if there was no other way that people could hear what he was wanting to say. And the reality was, is that he wasn't really that great of a speaker. He wasn't good enough to hold people's attention past 25 minutes, let alone 45 minutes. And people started zoning out. They started losing interest halfway through. They couldn't even remember what the sermon was about, how it started. So his very important message that they needed to hear wasn't even getting heard in those 45 minutes. And the volunteers and childcare were about to rip their hair out, as you can imagine. You've got to start questioning the motive. Who's this really about? You know, I believe it's really easy for pastors to believe that what they are doing is the most important thing. I was there. I get it. Everyone, you know, they, they believe that everyone needs to come and be a part, which means showing up, tithing, volunteering, and then bringing someone else, which, by the way, those are the, those are the four, what we call the four qualifications of, what, of expectations of what pastors and churches are looking for these days, those four things. Come, show up, tithe, give, volunteer in the church, and then bring someone else to do the same thing. Every Sunday. Just for the principle of it, because that's what you're supposed to do. And then they'll say that it's biblical somewhere. This is very similar to a business, by the way. Come, pay, be a part of the rewards club, and then refer a friend. Which, if you want to do it that way, I guess, okay. The problem is that it doesn't really work for churches. You know, most ministries and nonprofits don't even do things this way. See in your ministry as the most important thing, is perfectly natural. But expecting others to feel the same way is not. It's not natural. And then making them feel guilty for not feeling the same way you feel? You know, that starts to look a little crazy, quite honestly. Let's say what a pastor is doing on Sundays is really, really important. And I'm not saying that it's not important to some degree. What would be the best way to get others to feel the same way that it's really important? What would be the best way to do that? I mean, how did Jesus do it? How, how did he get so many followers without the internet, without TV, without radio, without mass marketing? How did he do it? I mean, his ministry was pretty much based on word of mouth, right? He worked with everyday people, but his work was not everyday. It was extraordinary. What he was doing and saying, it wasn't slick. It wasn't traditional. It wasn't historical. It wasn't ordinary at all. He was doing something that was, at its very foundation, inspirational. He didn't have to tell people to spread the word. Matter of fact, he told several people not to spread the word. In several situations, he's told people, hey, don't tell anybody I healed you. But they couldn't help themselves. <laughs> they, they couldn't not tell someone because of how inspirational it was. Now, the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, you probably remember her. She had an incredible experience with Jesus at that well. It was so inspirational that she was changed forever. And then according to verse 39, it says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. She said, He told me everything I ever did. I just don't see Jesus making people feel guilty for not choosing to listen to him and not choosing to follow him. 
He put it out there and it was their choice. I see him confronting those who are supposed to be spiritual. I, I get that. The, you know, the, the religious leaders of the time and calling him out and calling him hypocrite. I get that. I see that. But not the average person. It's because his motives were pure. His motives were to, to love people unconditionally and to teach them about his father. That's what was so different about Jesus. That's what made him and his teachings inspirational, life-changing. If a church has a purpose, and they do, I mean, almost all churches have purposes or missions or mission statements or purpose statements or goals or etc. And let's say that purpose is to, at the very, very least, equip Christians and reach the lost. Wouldn't it be important to be effective at doing that? I mean, if you're not effective at doing that, obviously you're not doing it. How does making people feel guilty help further your purpose? If someone doesn't want to hear you, does it help to make them feel guilty for not listening? If someone has come to a few of a specific church's services and finds them quite honestly uninspirational or boring, how does it help that church's purpose by making them feel guilty? I, I'm, I'm really fuzzy on this. If people are not inspired by what they experience, shouldn't we start looking at what we're doing and questioning why? Instead of just thinking that people should come because they're supposed to, shouldn't we stop and think, is what we're doing inspirational? Now, as I said before, that no business blames the customer for not having a good experience. Matter of fact, there's a certain business statement. It's been around for quite some time. You may have heard it before. It's called, the customer is always right. No nonprofit blames a potential volunteer for not wanting to come back. No nonprofit just assumes that volunteers will volunteer because they're supposed to. People volunteer for stuff and stick with it because they see value. They are inspired and they believe, truly believe in its purpose. They show up because they want to. That's making disciples. Rob Bell, in his book, Velvet Elvis, it's been a few years back, he described establishing the church uh, Mars Hill in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He talks about the marketing aspect, or in their case, the lack of marketing. He told his leaders that he didn't want to set up signs on the streets pointing to where their location was. Some people in marketing would probably have a heart attack of that thought. But his idea was, with the signage, it makes it kind of makes it easy for people to kind of point out. And their goal was not to make it easy. Their goal was to make people want to find them. Which would lead all the way back to their purpose. Their goal and purpose was to have a Sunday service that would ultimately be inspirational. It would be extraordinary to the point of not just being different, but leading back to the source of inspiration, Jesus. And of course, yeah, Rob Bell, he was a gifted speaker. People would come just to hear him. But they don't stick around because he's a great speaker. He was more gifted in knowing that people need to connect to the relational value of who Jesus is. And that's why his teachings were centered around digging deeper into the stuff that Jesus said. And that made it real for people. They could understand. And it ended up being inspirational. People wanted more. They showed up because they wanted to. Now, some may think that I'm trying to sugarcoat things for the lost, right? Or attenders. To water it down, to make it entertaining. You know, that old seeker-sensitive model. But those things don't last. That's why the seeker-sensitive model's not around anymore. Inspiration lasts. I'm not talking about going out and getting better lighting. I'm not talking about going out and getting a, a hipper band. 
I'm not going out saying, hey, I say, I'm not telling you to go out and, and find, you know, better graphics or whatever. Inspiration lasts. Rob Bell knew that, and so his church became one of the fastest growing churches in the United States. Let's, let's clear up one thing here real quick. Going to church is not the main thing of a Christian's life. It's just not. It's not a bad thing. As a matter of fact, it could be a very, very good thing. But it mainly depends upon the leadership and what their motives are. If a church's main purpose is truly to equip Christians and to reach the lost, it needs to make sure its main program that's designed to do that is effective. If the main program then is a Sunday morning service from 1030 to 1130, which for most churches it is, it needs to make sure that that hour is one that is effective, that's inspirational. It might be time to quit blaming people who don't show up. And I know for a fact it's definitely time to quit saying they're not Christians. I think it's time to have an honest conversation about what you're doing and why. If you have a main program on Sunday morning for one hour and the teaching slash preaching is 40 to 45 minutes of that hour, basically the majority, you're putting the pressure on that teaching and preaching time to be really good and inspirational. If it's not, it might be time to reevaluate. If you got a pastor is speaking, he's not that great of a public speaker, and he's speaking for 45 minutes, you may have an issue. Pastors who are preaching, they might need to set aside their pride and start talking about more effective ways to equip people, more effective ways to communicate, more effective ways to lead to inspiration. Maybe, now just, just hear me out, don't throw a rock yet, Maybe sermons are not the best way to do that. I mean, for most, as I said before, I would say most pastors are not really great public speakers. I'm sure some people will be ready to burn me at the stake for that blasphemy, but it might be true. I mean, true preaching was established originally for all Christians, and it looked more like what the woman at the well did, just telling people, proclaiming. True effectiveness doesn't mean more entertaining, entertainment or entertaining. It doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't, doesn't mean higher quality of production value. The most effective worship services that I was a part of in ministry, specifically in student ministry, centered around a circle of kids, a guitar, and a pure motive. Our mission was to worship God. I preached, we're going to put a smile on God's face. That was our mission. I followed that, I taught that, and I modeled that. That's what leadership looks like. Taking yourself out of the equation and doing what is needed to lead others to inspiration. And who is the source of inspiration? Right. Students came because they saw something of value, of worth. Not because I preached at them to show up, and definitely not because I laid on the guilt trip. Typically, a church is set up with one main program, the Sunday morning service. It's become less and less effective as the years go by. A church's purpose has been to equip Christians and reach the lost. Well, maybe it's time to change how that's done. Instead of guilting people for not hanging out or coming or being a part or being dedicated enough, maybe it'd be better to inspire them. That process, though, starts with an honest conversation. What are we doing and why? What pastor and leadership can have the guts to set aside their pride and to start this conversation? The answer, a church that wants to be around for the next decade or more. And a church that is already 
linked up with the source of inspiration and can lead others to that same source, Jesus. I'd like to encourage you to be willing to rethink, research, and rediscover the mysteries of God, the life of Jesus, and the purpose of the Ecclesia. Now, what I'm asking you to do, it's no easy task, nor is it popular, that's for sure. Some might say, hey, just go to church and listen to the sermon and all will be good. Unfortunately, that's not nearly enough. Take a hold of this faith in God with both hands. Claim it for your own. Investigate God. Get to know him on a much deeper level. But just remember, every bit of this starts with a willing spirit to stop and think. If you spend any time learning about this Jesus in any of the four books that are dedicated to his life in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to quickly find out that his message revolved around this very same mindset. Stop and think. Thanks for your time and your willingness to listen. I'll be back next episode discussing the truths of Christianity that you may never have known before. They may sound quite crazy, but true.